That great business show, Ireland's best business podcast. That great business show.com is brought to you by De facto shaving oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 107 of That Great Business Show. We like to be called Ireland's best business podcast because we are. We're posting this episode on the 30th of September, 2022. I am your host, Conal O'Moran. I keep repeating a phrase used by my former co-host, Jamie Heaslip, as I think it's apt. He likes to say, gradually, then suddenly, because that's what's happening. I'm delighted that we're getting Team GPS, our loyal listeners, to share, share, share the podcast on LinkedIn. I'm claiming a 1,000% rise in those of you sharing, so thank you all for that. As I have explained, hundreds of you press the like button every week, but instead, if you press the share button, then the podcast goes to your followers, and that gives the podcast viral reach. It's very, very powerful, so please press share right now. And so, to episode 107, here's a typical business scenario for you. You've shaken hands, you've said, put it there, you've said, it's a deal. Now you've changed your mind. Can you be sued? Our legal Batman and Robin are here to help get you out of the bat doo-doo. They'll also be telling you about a new legal podcast we're all involved with. Yes, we are growing, so stay tuned. And we also have a former board member of Meta in Ireland, that's Facebook to you and I, investing in second-hand items because there's a business in that. More in a minute. All our great tips and insights are brought to you, as always, by that great Irish company, De Facto Shaving Oil, made in Mayo, sold worldwide. The boss there, Tom Murphy, is looking for high-energy salespeople serving the grooming market worldwide to sell the world's best shaving oil. If you want to know more, send Tom an email at tom at pamex, P-A-M-E-X dot I-E, and the man himself will take it from there. De facto shaving oil, smooth as... One of my two guests for this, our first item was a board member at Meta Platforms in Ireland, also known as Facebook. That's a pretty big job. He's also held senior positions at Wish. You probably know them from their annoying ads on your phone. He's been a senior at Google and other big name companies, having started off a long time ago as a software engineer with Ericsson. So why is he investing in a company headed by a man who worked for Movies Extra, then with comms company Fleischmann Hilliard in China? Then Tesco, then a company involved with the Beijing Olympics, then House of Fraser, and now with Open for Vintage. And therein lies the answer. Open for Vintage sells pre-owned luxury fashion items, including jewellery, handbags, watches from the likes of Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Hermes, Dior, and Chanel. And they have been raising money to take over the world. Colin Saunders is the movie's extra man, and Dave Geraghty is the meta and Money Man, welcome to you both to That Great Business Show. Colonel, thank you very much for having us both here today. I thought you were going to say nothing. <laughs> we <laughs> not don't, not we not don't do quiet here. You are uh, both. Well, maybe it was that incredible intro, was it? Well, it was. But the fact that you uh, managed to dig up Movie Extras, which uh, was an amazing company I was involved with in university, um, which is now... Uh, Sad to say, more than twenty years ago, but uh, yeah, very well, very well researched. But that was a, that was a great company to to start off with, tech enabled. Um, I'm bringing bringing extras for the first time via technology into TV series in Ireland. It was a a great first first role in uni. And if I close my eyes, why do I find your voice very familiar? Um, I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> but maybe it is because. There, 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 my, my father, John, was uh, once upon a time also a journalist as well. Uh, in RTE, in RTE, sports RTE. journalist, right. very, very well known, and now has gone on to mega things internationally with the aforementioned Fleischmann Hilliard. And I shall repeat what my mammy, my late mammy, used to say. It's amazing how ability runs in families. Colin <laughs> Saunders and Fleischmann Hilliard. John Saunders in charge of Fleischmann Hilliard. But anyway, you have now moved on to... Open for Vintage, or is not it? Yeah, it is Open, open for, for vintage. vintage, yes. 
So tell us, you may as well start by telling us what does Open for Vintage do, because I have seen this model before. You're not the only ones at all, at all, at all in this area. Um, no, we're not. There are many, many players in the luxury resale world. And for ourselves as the founding team a few years ago in looking at this space, that provoked a lot of the curiosity about understanding luxury vintage and understanding resale in a lot more detail. You mentioned I previously worked for Tesco and Tesco is an extraordinary company in that it equips you with an operating model mentality. How do we and why do we do things the way that things are done? And it allows you to scrutinize other companies' business models in the way that they do things to identify, well, do you actually think that there may be a better way to do it? And around 2015, the word sustainability was becoming the hot topic. And my wife, who is from Sweden, was even commenting, I remember around the time that the, the Christmas gift of the year in Sweden that year was a secondhand present. And I just started really diving into what was going on in this world. Um, while everybody was suddenly very interested in sustainability and consumer behavior was changing right in front of us. So you have that. And then in parallel, you had the emergence of extraordinary businesses like Deliveroo, Airbnb, Uber, the platform businesses, those that are bringing together buyers and sellers, but not holding anything in the middle. And we started looking and asking ourselves, was anybody, what was happening in luxury resale in this world? And we started looking at the the businesses, as you say, there are many out there, the likes of Vestiaire Collective. And we started realizing that their business model, which is a model where kind of your wife may want to sell her handbag to Dave's wife, it would need to be collected, verified, repackaged and sent out again. And we, which, which does happen. It does happen, absolutely. And that is what many of the players in the, the market leaders currently do. But we took a view that actually that may is very, very difficult to make money from because there's so many touch points and so much time involved. And the big challenge that you have in resale is you only ever have one of every product. There's, you might have the same Chanel handbag or the same Hermes handbag, but the conditions will be different. There is no, you, every product is unique given its condition, its state and where it's come from. It's been owned by somebody. So therefore, you can't say two are the exact same. So we focused on doing things differently. And the way that we do things differently is we only sell from really exciting, authenticated businesses. So we connect brilliant boutiques and we take their products and we bring their products onto the Open for Vintage platform. And we spent the first few years of this business focusing on building a global network of those boutiques. And that's everywhere from South Africa to Japan to the United States to Capri. And we focused on the technology, the infrastructure to bring them together. We have built for scale and we've built for profitability because we don't hold the stock. We have nearly 100 million euro of product on our website today and we have no balance sheet risk over that. So that gives us a really competitive edge versus what the existing players are doing. And now we're at a really exciting part of the journey where we are now one of the leading sources of Chanel handbags on the internet. The infrastructure is great. And now it's time for us to really lean in and to start selling those handbags to the world. And this is why we now come to the point that David Garrity has become involved in the business. <laughs> he's good, isn't he? He talks he's, a lot. Well, he's, he's very good. He's and I just know like his dad. <laughs> well, look, I've never met his dad, but I can I can only imagine. I mean, look, you you were going to ask me, and I, Colin's kind of hinted towards it, which is like, well, what are you doing here, Dave? Well, I I've had about six months of listening to Colin talking like that. So how could you not want to be involved? How could you not it's want impressive. to get involved? I, I it, that, it, yeah. it is very impressive. And look, I think you know where you, you gave a nice outline of who I am and where I've come from. I mean, I spent. 25 plus years, you know, organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible. I think that's one company that I worked with. Uh, another company talks about, you know, 
basically being the social fabric and a social network for, for, for the world. But as part of both of those and as part of my, my wish experience, what I've seen is a real value of e-commerce and the value that the internet provides for, for just building out businesses, connecting people, connecting B2C, connecting products to exactly where it should be and doing this globally and in a scalable way. So I guess at a, at a personal level, you know, my work career, I've had a, a real passion for people, product and customers. And that's the way I've phrased it. And people, we're looking at one across the table here and you, you meet passionate people who just have an idea. And then I, I got to talk to Colin, I got to see the product. And the product is that platform that he's just described. What was the connection between the pair of you? Mutual, um, mutual friends, I guess. I um, I have invested in a, in a few companies in Dublin over the last couple of years, and some of them have been with another couple of guys. And they were introduced to Colin, and they were told they should talk to me, and I was told I should talk to him. So it's it's mutual connections, it's network. Something he else he we can talk about. He down with the conversation that he, he said, "Listen, just take to this guy, and just take him away from us. <laughs> he'll yeah. talk, he'll talk at you for a while." But it's a sign we 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 share good friends because these friends also said. We now see where you are in the journey and we think the likes of Dave who has gone on this journey before with the companies like Google, like Facebook, who can support in this scaling journey is the right person to, to connect with at this time. And that's, and that's proven really true. So Dave has been very helpful for us as a management team to get, to get our act together as we get ready to grow. And Dave, you are in as a consultant, correct? Yeah, I'm an investor. Yeah. And I'm a consultant. I work with Colin on a, I mean, it's a, it's supposed to be a percentage of my time. Um, that percentage is 115% at last count. Um, but yes, I'm spending time with Colin and the company, um, you know, helping them scale, helping them think about the next phase, whether that is, you know, I'm not an expert in the pre-owned luxury market, but I have a lot of expertise so you're a Chanel in scaling. Guy. I, <laughs> I, I have very little Chanel product. Um, but no, what I would say is like my, my expertise is more in, I've run operational teams, I've run large operational teams. I've helped companies scale globally. You know, I've online advertising experience and then just building out teams and just driving the culture. I mean, Open for Vintage already employs 14 people and it's going to be growing rapidly. Because you have funded. Yes. And I mean, you continue we, to fund. Well, the, the, we, so I think um, for those that have, you know, read the, the news cycle in the last week or so, um, you know, it's been been announced where we have just gone through, I say we, I'm part of the Open for Vintage team, but I was an investor in that funding round. Um, so the company is funded. Uh, like every e-commerce company, we will continue to look for funding. I mean, I think this is part of Colin's job, which is always be raising. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to be out there looking for more money to grow, grow our customer base over because time. Because 14... Is a very small number. Of course, it's brilliant, but I presume you're thinking of 140 and then 1,400 people. If the platform, if I understand the platform, if it's going to be global, I, I think I would. I would think to 140. I think at 1,400, I actually think we will have failed because at that point, then you're at a stage where you wouldn't need that volume of employees if, unless you have warehousing, unless you have a lot of infrastructure, unless you've moved away from a capital light business model, which is at the core of how we do things and the why we do things and why we're doing this and why Chanel and why Hermes, I think is really interesting, particularly in the in the climate that we have at the moment where a lot of people are pulling back on the spend. But what's actually, which is almost counterintuitive, is that luxury is growing. So in this climate, uh, you're seeing Chanel has put up their prices Four times. Get away. Yeah. So in the well, last... That's outside of uh, inflation. Uh, Absolutely. And that's almost, I think, one of the reasons why is that there is this constant demand for the heritage brands like Chanel, like Hermes, like for so many women out there, the, asp the aspiration on the handbag is to have a Hermes Birkin handbag. That would be the pinnacle. But you're on a waiting list for four or five years in order to access that. You have to buy a, a variety of other products from Hermes to do that. Whereupon with Open for Vintage, through our boutique network, you can have one tomorrow. Now, you said that you had gone all over the world chatting, I presume, to boutiques. Maybe you've just done it on the phone. How, how do you actually lock them in? It's a very good question. So my co-founder, James Loftus, specifically focuses on growing our global network. So, and in fact, of the team that we're now scaling out, we've just started a boutique team here in Dublin which is focusing on developing the relationships with our existing boutique networks and then also growing 
into new markets. So in the last two weeks, we've welcomed boutiques in Switzerland and South Africa. So we go out in the world, we identify in each market who are the best players in each market. We have extraordinary sellers in the Middle East. We have four or five in Japan. We're in Hong Kong. Uh, and oh, what even the numbers are actually doable. I was wondering whether you had four or 400 maybe in Japan or something like that. No, no we have, I mean, right as, as of today, we are in 15 countries. We have boutiques, um, as I say, everywhere from Capri to Japan. And we have a pipeline of several hundred more to bring on over the next few years. But what we've actually learned over the last years, it's not actually all about how many boutiques you have. It's about the quality of the boutiques you have. Because in our business, the biggest determinant of success is trust. We are selling every single product that we sell is pre-owned. So therefore, if you are endeavoring to try and make a connection with a customer to spend thousands of euro with you on a handbag, They have to really trust you. And therefore, the way that we build trust is by connecting the consumer with the best product in the market from the best boutiques. So we are cherry pick the boutiques. Not not every boutique can rock up and just start selling with us. So we cherry pick them. We bring them through an authentication process. We meet the team. We do an awful lot of work before one item gets featured on our platform. So what we've learned is focus on the best in market and focus on those that are best in the products that we know our customers love, which is your Chanel's, your Hermes, your Louis Vuitton's. And you do not, because you've just told me, sell clothes. No, we don't. No, Why? We, we learned early on, we did feature clothes for a while, but what we actually learned is it's very, very challenging to give consumers accurate sizing information when everything is secondhand and across the decades. V- vintage, people talk about like, what is vintage? Vintage is actually belonging to a decade, a period. It's the 80s vintage, 90s vintage. What is the size of a small Oscar de la Rente dress from the 1980s versus a small Yves Saint Laurent dress from the 1960s? They bear no relation. They're from different vintages. Women were a different size. So in order for us to give accurate details, it's very, very challenging. And therefore, we weren't able to deliver a brilliant customer experience. So therefore, we decided, let's not focus on that. Let's focus where we can deliver excellence. And that's what we do. A couple of unfair questions. <laughs> Are vintage clothes or vintage products across the, all the, the, the quality and names that you've mentioned? Are they any better than your standard handbag or your standard whatever? I, 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 I'm going to obviously say yes. And, and I think the, the honest answer is yes, they are. And if you look... I had Brie Judd Donoghue. She's the of doyen course, yes. of, <laughs> of pennies in here. Yes. And she looked at me in my shirt and she kind of poo-pooed it because it wasn't a penny shirt. And I'm looking at you and you ain't wearing Chanel nor Dior <laughs> nor... <laughs> I, I am not the customer necessarily, but we, I do endeavour to make sure the customer can discover those brands. I think what you see is you see... The brands that we sell are made for a lifetime, not for a season. If you look at a Hermes bag and you look at the craftsmanship that goes into it, it's extraordinary. Historically, I think what would happen would be consumers would buy this bag and then would never do anything with it again. They would buy, they would use it a few times, they would live in the wardrobe. But now, with the way that the world has become and that consumers are becoming more socially conscientious, they like to think, how do I reuse this? How do I generate this again? How do I extend its lifespan? And that's what we're focusing on, is bringing more and more people into the circular economy, buying, selling handbags, keeping them going longer and longer. But the good news is it's also a business. You're not just doing good. You're you're making money, I hope. And I take it you are taking a cut on the way through. Is that how it works? That's how we work. So it's a you win, we win model. So if we sell the handbag on behalf of our boutiques, then we take a cut along the way. And if you don't sell, nothing's happening. Yeah, we better start selling stuff. And you get a phone call from Dave. <laughs> <laughs> what is the uh, longer term goal in com- who are your big competitors and who? How do you muscle them out of the market? Yeah, well, look, I think as, <clears throat> as Colin outlined there, there's there's something unique about what we do, which again, would go back to one of the reasons that I got involved. And the uniqueness is the marketplace, the way that we connect really, really top end boutiques to the customer. So authentication and trust. We, we sell on trust. We, we live on trust. I think that's really important. 
I think to go back to your question on scale and, you know, employing 140 and 1400 people, the bit in the middle is probably one of the main reasons I also got involved and others that, that, I, uh, that I know. The technology and the platform is actually very, very smart from the point of view of what you see is what you get pricing. I think that's really important and that differentiates us from our competitors. So if you're in Ireland and you're using the website or the, the mobile site and you click on a product, the price that you see there is what you pay. It gets delivered and customs are covered. That same product, if you're looking at it in the Czech Republic or if you're looking at it in North America, will have a different price, but it'll be the price that you pay based on where you live. So based on the customs. So if we're if a product has been shipped from the UK to Ireland, obviously there are different taxes and customs than if it's UK to UK. And your platform is handling all of that? So our platform handles all of that. That so is it's clever. Totally, that is good. totally transparent to the user. And it's, given the volatility yeah. of dollar versus euro versus, Bre- uh, I was yeah. going to say Brexit versus sterling, it's handling that dynamically on the hour every hour? We review. So yeah. part of our, 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 we call it the global pricing engine. And we, and we are the first player in the resale space to have, have developed this. Who's developed it now? Is it your IP or who we, owns it? We developed this. Well done, you. So we we took, a, there, there's a company I admire hugely um, called Farfetch. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy to use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms, or legs nick free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. Farfetch are a business that connects. Uh, they started out connecting boutiques, selling new goods and bringing their goods together, but not holding the stock, effectively creating net porte without holding the merchandise. We took a lot of inspiration from how they had done things and what we call the primary market, the primary being new goods. And I recall speaking with one of the top team at Farfetch in the early days of Open for Vintage and explaining, look, we're connecting these businesses globally and we aspire to connect them to consumers globally. And he made the point, he said, Colin, before you spend a dollar on marketing, crack customs. So we really honed in on it early to, so that we can, we know if you're a customer and you're spending thousands of euro on a Chanel handbag, the last thing you want is a text message from a from a DHL or on post saying you owe us eight hundred euro to get it out of customs. Absolute, that is not the type of experience we want our customers to have. So again, I bring it back that we have focused on the infrastructure and the supply and the customer experience early, before leaning into scaling. Because we, as a business, are not interested in growing top line unless it has a very clear route to profitability on the bottom line. And that is, I suppose, a mentality that we have had throughout the genesis and the beginning of the first few years of this business. Not always popular with venture capital funds, but times are changing. So we'll see We'll see where this goes. Because you did, am I right in saying that you did start with crowdfunding? We've done crowdfunding. If you, and that was, crowdfunding was a very helpful exercise because crowdfunding allowed us to test consumer interest on people wanting to get involved in, a, in a, as investors, but also as buyers and to assess the market. What, do people really want this? Do people like this? And, and we've done crowdfunding twice. And on both occasions, I think we closed our rounds within a week. And you also use two different uh, platforms, am I right? Absolutely. So the, again, this comes back to the point about community by raising on the two leading platforms. One being Cedar, one being... Cedars and Crowdcube. So okay. by doing it on the two platforms, what that allowed us to do was to reach as many eyeballs as possible without having to invest in marketing dollar. And you've now hired a lady 
to do your marketing in London, am I right? So we've actually, we're, we're building out an entire marketing team out of London. We welcomed Laura uh, onto the team recently, who was previously part of the brand team at Victoria Beckham. Uh, we've also well. She's got a great CV. I was reading that. Yeah, she yeah she's remar- and the wonderful thing with Laura is that she will take the brand from the early point, and we are now really positioning and working to position Open for Vintage as the top of the pyramid, the leading platform that you come to for luxury goods. Not that anything would ever happen, but what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> what but, keeps you awake at night? Um, it's a it's a good question. Technology is forever on the back of my mind and making sure that we're delivering a great experience for our customers. I think in, in this climate, you you would be remiss not to be looking at, at the broader macro trends. Are people still shopping? Do people still want what we are offering? And, in, and it's interesting when you look at that, uh, again, in so many areas of retail, people are pulling back. But in our area... Chanel, Hermes, they're recording huge profits in these times. And I look at the demand that people are having. And the other interesting dynamic you have is people are shopping more and more secondhand. Because even when in the primary market, the market for new goods that people might say, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I don't want to spend that much. They start looking at the secondhand market. And we saw that actually in, the la, in, in a previous recession as well. That's when things really started lifting here. But now you have a dynamic of people are maybe a bit price conscious, but also conscious about their footprint and society. So our message to you is: you can be great for the environment and still enjoy Chanel. And isn't that a be- isn't that a fantastic thing? Round figures. What's the most expensive item that you have on the platform? I think today the most expensive would be a Hermes Birkin at approximately a hundred thousand euro. What? You've just? Uh, I was laughing to myself, thinking three, four thousand quid. And people are not spending 100,000 quid on a handbag. So Hermes Birkin, since 1980, the price of a Hermes Birkin has tracked <laughs> higher than gold. So investing, not buying, investing in a Hermes Birkin is a very sensible asset. And in fact, it's actually Credit Suisse have just come out with a report highlighting that handbags are one of the safe harbors to invest in during these times. So <sighs> I've heard it all now. <laughs> and you're also, of course, looking forward to recessions. There, there are always counter cycles and counter views, no matter what you're involved in. And if you're saying to me that uh, recessions are good for your business, um, well, look, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think any of us would would wish uh, a recession upon us. But I do, having looked at historically during recessionary times luxury brands tend to weather the storm rather well. And in this environment, it's luxury brands plus the, the broader movement towards buying resale. So I think we're, we're, we're quite well protected. I'm yeah. still kind of gobsmacked 100,000 quid for a handbag. No, it's uh, <clears throat> not for me. Dave, no, you're, no, you're, you're 100,000 I'm, I'm euro 100, man. No, I'm not 100,000 euro man for a handbag. I think um, the, the what, keep, what keeps people awake at night question is, I mean, Colin kind of, leaned into what this strategy now is. And again, if I go back to, you know, if you look at the platform that's in place, you look at the solution, they, there's three components. There's the supply. And I, I I feel we've done a really amazing job on getting really top end supply onto the platform, whether it's a, the 100,000 handbag. And obviously that is, a, that's the the exception versus there's a lot more good value items there to be, to be purchased. The platform itself, which I am very excited about, the what you see is what you get global pricing engine. I mean, I think that is... I mean, I can see the smile in your face and I think a lot this of your... This is clever. It really is clever. And I, I know a little bit about this. Yeah, yeah and I think, you know, you, you, a lot of your listeners, while, you know, we, we probably lost one or two of them on the uh, the, the handbag discussion, I think we'll get <laughs> no, one or two. No, they're all going, <laughs> yeah. what? They're all asking everybody else, 100,000. Did I hear that right? I think they'll, uh, they might find, they might be able to relate a little more to the to the technology side as well. So I think that is really, really smart. And I think there's other really, you know, cool automation tools in there with regard to populating the platform and making sure it is high quality, good branded items, you know, from the boutiques, et cetera. So the technology is really smart. So if I look at the supply, the technology, and then the third part is the customer. Like if we can, and this is where we are at now, really bring customers to the site to realize that Open for Vintage is, you know, is a really high-end experience. You're getting your product in there. You're not getting that 
random text to say you owe us a few hundred euros in uh, in customs. You're not being asked for an extra 25 euros for delivery, et cetera, et cetera. It's there. Having that experience, you know, just really, really high on people's agenda these days, it's something that we're really excited about. And I think and that's the bit. It doesn't give me awake at night. It keeps us excited to like really go and then hire Laura, hire this marketing team in. I mean, this is what, you know, this is the beauty of online marketing. This is the beauty of being able to attract people on the website. And I presume you've had the discussions with your growing team, the marketing team. Where are you likely to focus? Because obviously coming on to a high-end podcast like this, you're uh, you're doing the right thing. But in general, for the, where do you market to people who are willing to spend €100,000 on a handbag? So we're, we're getting a lot of learning on, on this at the moment. So we, we, we sell to more than 60 countries. So... That in and of itself, we can see patterns for where the traffic is coming, where the, where where the orders are coming. What we are seeing a significant sea change is the demand from the United States. So, unsurprisingly, because of the strength of the dollar, all of our European boutiques are suddenly becoming rather appealing because obviously there's such a with dollar being so strong, prices are looking rather attractive. So, our Team, as we are looking at this, we we believe there's a very strong market opportunity to grow into the United States. So, what do you do to get into the states? I mean, there's only 350 million people you can there's, talk to. It's big. So, one of the one of the lessons I learned from my time in China um, is don't have a China strategy, have a Beijing strategy, have a Shanghai strategy, and that lesson would also be applied to the United States. What's your Connecticut strategy? How do you reach high-valued customers in a market like Connecticut, and maybe Austin and maybe New York, but you don't need to connect with 350 million people? You might need to connect with 300,000. And therefore, who are the perhaps influencers of the communities that they're involved in? And what you ideally want to do is then is connect in with them. And Evelyn Moynihan of um, Kilkenny Design said almost the exact same thing. They sell into the Irish diaspora in the States and then she rattled off a few. Then she tells me, that's a big Irish diaspora in Texas. And I'm thinking, what? And she obviously knows. And yes, there is. Yeah. And if you want a connection to Connecticut, I am your buckle. There's the Ireland Connecticut Business Council there, ready for you. We are the Ireland Connecticut Business Council. So there. Very good. You I've, didn't know that by I the look not, in your face. But I have stayed in Old Greenwich before and I would be delighted to connect. Thank you. Well, we shall do so. There's a lovely guy there called PJ Chimini who should be looking after you. Is the business, do you count it as being Irish or is it Ireland and UK or what would you call it? Well, I, let me go first. I think Colin's ready to jump in. It's a global business. I yeah. mean, we have people based um, officially in Ireland and the UK and actually further afield. Uh, Where's developers. HQ? Uh, that, that's a good question. I mean, we have people in Dogpatch Labs and I think this is a an opportunity to even make a shout out there and the wider Irish startup community as well where, you know, the the interaction bumping into other companies in there has actually been quite useful in the last couple of weeks. Um, so Colin and his founder are Irish, but spent Colin's a global a global child, as you as yeah. you just heard. So I, I, would, I would describe us as a global company. Love it. I mean, that is the future, isn't it? That is what we all are. Absolutely. I mean, our, our, our team are international. We're based international. We're selling internationally. And I, I am back living in Dublin and, and, and thoroughly enjoying being, being home after nearly 15 years away. But every day when, when we as a, as a company are coming together, we're not necessarily just thinking about about the Irish market, we very much I understand that, yeah. No, I just wanted to wonder where the HQ was, yeah. So you, you were bitching there about the VCs. <laughs> will they not give you? Will they not give you money? No, I, I look. I think there, there's horses for courses, and at, and at different times, different types of investors are, are the right type. And and also, I think there needs to be an acknowledgement of where you are in in your own journey as well. But what I see as a as a bit of a macro trend at a, across many VCs investors, VCs love a trend. Like you speak them, oh, you're you're in you're doing grocery home shopping, or you're you're in medtech, or you're in crypto, and I think we I wouldn't mention crypto to them at the moment. <laughs> no, I think there's been a few few people a little bit burned. But what what I have broadly recognised in the in the few years that uh, that I've been working on this business is that there was a a, a big focus bordering perhaps on obsession around top line growth, growth at all costs. You've got to take market share, go, go, go. And the focus on fundamentals, on 
how are you going to scale and grow and become profitable was perhaps secondary. And we've seen, and it's really been this year, I've seen a bit of a sea change like that. And the conversations are now different. And I spoke with a VC the other day and they said, well, we've never invested in resale before because we don't see the peer-to-peer platforms having a path to profitability. And we discussed our model, which of course is we don't hold any of the stock, we're capital light. We're, and, there, and there was kind of a, this is quite interesting. So suddenly I'm getting validation good. back. So we like that. This is good. So what are you going to do next? Are you going to raise more capital? That's, I just got the impression of that from what I read. Um, Dave. Yeah, yes, we are. We're going to raise more capital. Cave aid and when and where? Um, well, we're, we're currently talking to anybody who wants to talk to us. We're doing the rounds. And as Colin said, our... Our story is being well received, so we would hope to raise capital this year. Um, I mean, I don't know if we we haven't got a, a, a top line exactly how much yet, but I mean, we have a path to profitability. There's an Irish uh, lad who made a few money, a few quid out of selling to Nike. You may even know him, and I think he might be a person to chat to because he understands exactly what you're talking about. And yeah, we can actually connect you because we he is also part of Team GBS. So uh, you are going to raise capital when? So ASAP or? Look, uh, we, we, as you, we recently, we, we closed the, the last funding round. We were very lucky that there's been considerable interest since. We have a number of changes. We've obviously hired some great people onto the team. We have a fantastic new website going live to consumers shortly. It's been when is that going to go live? That, that will be live, thankfully, in time for peak. So by the time you're shopping around Black Friday, you're uh, you're going to see a whole new experience. So that's in November. November or certain? In November. In, yeah, you yeah. see that. And, and the way you said that, I can tell that there's been a hitch. Actually, no, there's not. It's just, but you, you also do have to recognize you want to give people time to, uh, you want to get, get it out there, you want to get it live, you want to get it settled, and then you don't want to be, again, it comes back to trust. Don't bring, drive people to a website that they're oh, not going to have a fantastic, yeah. make sure it's... it's if it's fun. there and working, it has to be working. Come here to me, you know the last questions. And actually, just before, yes, before you jump in, yeah. no, sorry, because yeah. the, the, the H-bit is interesting. I mean, I think what you have is, you have a very well-functioning website. Please, everybody, have a, have a look at it right now. I mean, and you will see the product. Uh, like every good leader and every good startup, you go, is there a slightly different and better way to do this? And one of the things that we've looked at in the last couple of weeks has been, yeah, actually, this would provide a really solid foundation for the growth that we are going to see. And to make that change, you know, to to, to change the tire on the uh, the jumbo jet when it's on the ground before it takes off is always easier than when it's actually midair. So, uh, no, I don't think there's been a hitch. I think it's been a... It's just been a good strategic decision. So I think it's going to be a really nice uh, nice experience for the users. And in fact, some of this is in the back end. People won't even notice, which is, again, part of the beauty of this technology. I mean, it's simple. It's straightforward. So uh, quite exciting on that. That sounds like very reassuring. I'm reassured. I'm glad. Uh, <laughs> question. So am I. My last question, because I sent you the email. Hire in a heartbeat, and both of you have got to have one each, or as many as you want each. But who would you hire in a heartbeat? Let you go first. Well, well, I'm going to go That's, first. This is Dave Curry. This is Dave Curry yeah. going first. Yeah, like, so who would I hire? Well, I mean, look, I, I'd hire Colin because he is referred to Sancho. We away. need him um, <laughs> for this business. <laughs> I'm in a different place. I mean, like I think you know, a lot of a lot of my time is with uh, with Open for Vintage. I'm looking after myself, so I I have a wide network that I like to take advantage of. And I have thought about your question, and I think there's a a ten percent from about ten different people that I'd like to plug in together, and they know who they are. They're people who kind of talk to me on a regular basis. You've so. got to name them. The whole point is that we stick this up onto LinkedIn, yeah. and then we tag them, and then they say. Dave Garrett, he wants to hire me. And they, he ring, they, man, woman, rings you up. And the reason that I won't give you the name is because assuming that I'm hiring them, they'll expect money. They know who they are. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to leave this with the Colin because I think from a business point of view, from an open for vintage point of view, we've got a, a pretty pretty nice list. Or, well, we, we shortened it down. Yeah, we do. Look, we, uh, in, my, in my mind, if in tomorrow, the, the, the lady that I would love to hire is a lady named Natalie Massonette. And Natalie Massonet started an extraordinary business named Net of Forte. And what I think is inspirational about how Natalie Massonet did this was she married fashion and technology and content and engaging community early on and built an extraordinary business. She then has gone on into working with companies like Farfetch, the British Fashion Council. She is 
just an extraordinary accomplished person across the board, has now gone into uh, create her own venture capital fund named Imaginary. And so I think across the spectrum, she would bring tremendous value as we go forward to become the global leader in luxury resale. And why would you not tap uh, Imaginary for a few quid? I think at the right time, that may be a possibility. <laughs> Funny that it crossed my mind. <laughs> the, the Have other, you been in contact with them? Um, not at this moment, no. Okay, but uh, the the email or maybe the letter is in the post. The 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 other person I think which, which I should call out that we would love to hire is um, one of the greatest community builders out in this world, and 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 very positively a previous customer of ours is Kim Kardashian. Okay, so we were very fortunate to have. Um, connected with a stylist who worked with her a few years ago and uh, the stylist bought a few pieces from us and we were very fortunate to see Kim Kardashian stepping out in an item from Open for Vintage but as the most extraordinary person on social media I think she would add a lot of value as we as we build awareness of our brand. So what you're doing there is you're active you're on her uh, coat tails even without paying her. She's the, you'll get a solicitor's letter so shortly saying, <laughs> don't mention my client in connection with your firm unless you send on a bit, I don't know, $500,000 or more. I don't know what she charges. We looked into this. I think you'll get the solicitor's letter because this is your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that is this, uh, the voice of Dave Garrity and the other voice is Colin Saunders, both of Open for Vintage. Do check them out. I think it's going to be a great business. So uh, best of luck and uh, my regards to your dad, Joe. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Thank you, Gong. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make de facto the world's best shaving oil your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of de facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. That great business show. I am delighted to announce a new podcast has been added to our stable. I can officially announce the launch of The Fifth Court, a new podcast from the team that previously brought you Law on Trial. They won the Best Legal Podcast Award from the Law Society of Ireland very, very recently. Regular listeners will know my pal barrister Peter Leonard, who had previously joined us on that great business show, Talking Matters Legal. Today, he is joined by his podcast partner and law library buddy, barrister Mark Tottenham, who is also editor of the legal publication Decisis. They're here to promote that new podcast. But there's no such thing as a free ad on That Great Business Show. I have told them that we, Team GBS, want free advice from them. So, in the next 20 minutes, listen and learn and save yourselves a couple of thousand guineas about all you need to know about contract law. Peter Leonard BL, Mark Tottenham BL, welcome to That Great Business Show. Delighted to be here, Connell. Delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be in partnership with you going Mm. forward. Oh, that's nice as well. And I'm looking forward to it very much. And I love the name, The Fifth Court, because... Well, I think I'm going to have to let Mark answer that one because he is the person who came up with the name. Mark, will you please explain? It is known that there are four courts in the centre of the legal establishment. and In Dublin, because we not alone are an all-Ireland uh, podcast, but we are worldwide. So people need to know that the Four Courts is the centre of law in Ireland. Would that be fair? These days, the centre of civil law because the criminal courts have moved a little bit further up the Liffey to the criminal courts of justice. And one thing you're going to learn with Mark is precision. Yes. That's all oh, important yeah. in our game. So, talk to me, Mark, we leave Peter aside for this one, about the basis or the basics of contract law. I meet you in a pub I say to you, Mark, we're going to do business. Does that mean anything? Um, What it boils down to generally when we are looking at a contract 
is there's a question that the courts often ask, which is, was there an intention to create legal relations? And if the nature of your dealing is such that there was an intention to create legal relations, then that will be enforceable. Um, and there are a number of ways that they will assess that. Um, so, for example, if you take the example of somebody who, who, say, shook hands on a deal, now that would certainly be evidence that would tend towards uh, showing that you intended to create legal relations, but it would also depend on the circumstances. So, for example, if you attend, now I, I'm not familiar with the dealings of a horse fair, for example, but but famously people will shake hands on a deal. in so With the spit. Well, <clears throat> with or without the spit, they will shake hands on the deal and if that is the course of dealing that is generally recognised in such a dealing to, be, to, to make a contract, then the chances are that that will be considered enforceable. So if you go to a, a dealer and you say, right, I like the look of your horse, I'll pay €5,000 for it, um, I'll come along with the money in a week's time and pick it up. Um, if either of you doesn't meet what is required of that contract, the, the chances are that they can sue on it. If, on the other hand, you meet a friend of yours in the pub and you say, I'm buying a new car, my old one's going, would you be interested? And he says, sure, I'll give you four grand for it. You shake on it. And then a week later you go, actually, I've decided not to buy the new car. Or he says, um, I've decided I'm not interested. The chances are it's probably not uh, enforceable because, for example, he hasn't looked at the car. He might have, come, might have come and had a look at the car and said, actually, that's not worth four grand. Or, you know, th that even though you've shaken hands on the deal, it's not really in, in the course of dealing isn't such that you would be... It, you, you could imply legal relations. Into now, it. what about you're in the bar and nobody's recording you? You've not taken a note on the bar mat. It's just me and Peter chatting, and Peter and I say, "Yeah, we'll do a deal." There's no record of it anywhere. Well, can, well Peter, come in you for a moment. I'm going to leave it to Mark because Mark is the expert on this. But if we break it down to Fisher Price law, okay, what you've got is you have to have an offer. And then you have to have acceptance and you have to have something that goes between, which is called consideration in, in the legal lexicon. Um, and that is something transfers between the parties. And you must have, as Mark said, the intention to create legal relations, but you have to have an offer. So that means I say to you, do you want to buy my car? And you say, yes, I do want to buy your car. And then you transfer the consideration to me, which is money, which comes to me, and the car goes to you. So they're, they're the three component parts in order to have a valid uh, contract. And the and money that's Fisher and the, Price law. And, and that's, the money that's the and the consideration is the key one. Yes. How and ever I meet the man in the pub and I don't hand over any so called consideration, not even a penny. So then there ain't no contract. Is it, is it simple as that? Well, it depends on the agreement. I mean, if the, it, the I think you're talking about a question of evidence. If one of you says, I did make a deal, and the other one says, I didn't make a deal, yeah. then one of you is lying or one of you has forgotten. And so then the courts will look at the overall circumstances and say, which of you is more likely to be telling the truth? And that's obviously a difficult one. There was and, a very famous mm -hmm. case about a handshake, wasn't there, involving a man called Jim Flavin? I, I think you know more about that than I do. <laughs> we'll, we'll move on from there. So <laughs> and, yeah, but it's a very famous case mm. and it's well worth checking out mm. because it did involve a handshake or not. Look, the point about it is that it, it is all about basically the intention between the two parties. So, and, and you have to, in order for it to be a valid contract as well, so you do need consideration. So the, the, the handshake that Mr. Flavin engaged in was evidence that there was something transpiring and travelling between the two parties. There has to be something exchanged between the, the parties. The handshake is that, is yeah. it? Well, no, the handshake is evidence of something that was done. You know, the handshake is... You don't have to have a contract is valid even if it's just an oral contract. Uh, a handshake is, is something on top of the oral contract because it's a communication uh, signed between the two parties. And then obviously you can have a contract in writing, which is very easy. So we all have a look at what's written down and then we know what the terms of the contract are. So something like that, the handshake is evidence that there was a deal done and the deal was done in respect of, but there has to be consideration. It can't just be, well, I think I might like to do that. Do you think you might like to do that as well? There has to be something between the two parties parties and it has to be that there, there, there's an intention to create legal relations between the two parties. But it should also be said that there are some contracts that can't be just be made orally, that you need, uh, you, they have to be written down and there has to be a signature. And this goes back to 1695, the statute of frauds, where because it was known that 
there, some people would say that a contract had existed when it didn't, uh, when it didn't exist. There are some contracts you have to have in writing. One of them is a contract for the sale of land. You, you can't just agree a, a sale of land verbally. It has to be in writing. Second is a contract for somebody else's debts. In other words, a guarantee. So you can't enforce a guarantee that is made orally. It has to be in writing. And when you say in writing, does it have to be written in lengthy legalese? Or, back to my bar mat, can I say I'm taking on Mark Tottenham's debts? I think if it's a, a note or memorandum is the term that's usually used in contract law. If there's a note or memorandum and it's signed, and the note or memorandum can be more than one document. So if you've got an email going one way and somebody else just has a sort of, I agree to that and, sign, and signs it, and even a, a, an electronic signature may be sufficient in certain circumstances. Are those electronic signatures uh, legal nowadays? Again, it's yes, they all are. a question of evidence. Yeah, it, well, it is a question of evidence, but yes, they are. I mean, if, if somebody says, you know, please apply for something or please confirm by placing an electronic signature at the end of the document, that will be valid and it will be enforceable. That was, I keep reminding people, I think it was President Bill Clinton who yes. signed the first one of those in the world, in Ireland, and twenty, almost a quarter of a century later, we're still waiting for it. I'm still asking, are they valid or are they not? Because they're not. No, they are. They're entirely valid. No, good, they good, are good. entirely valid. Now, what about buyer's remorse or contract signer's remorse? Because on the introduction of the uh, podcast, I did uh, outline a situation where somebody says that they've done a deal and then you change your mind. How can you get out of it? Well, you can say that one of the terms of the contract was you hadn't agreed with it, uh, that something different happened. Uh, there is, you can claim, undue influence. Now, that's a classic, if well, you know what I mean. That what clogs that up the be? courts. Well, that's a perfect case where you say, uh, well, I didn't really intend to get into this contract, but I was unduly influenced. That happens in, in relation to a lot of banking contracts. Uh, in order to, it, for it to be a valid contract, you have to enter into it voluntarily. You can't be forced to do it. And the other thing is, if you say, well, I was sort of inveigled into this contract because I didn't really know what I was doing. This is like, you know, the famous Sean Quinn case, for example. You know what I mean? We signed off on this, but we didn't really we really know what we were doing, what we were getting into. And the this was something that we that? didn't really anticipate. Well, they will. They will. I mean, if if it is the case that, that somebody did enter into something on a false premise, wasn't aware what they were getting involved in, uh, and entered, in, it, it entered into it on that basis, which is almost like a fraudulent basis, uh, the courts will say, well, that's an invalid contract. It's void ab initio, to use a bit of Latin, which means that it never existed. Never existed. The arrangement between us never existed. Colin. You know that I sent Mark Tottenham an email this morning to tell him, do not use any of the Latin. Well, there you go. So <laughs> I've just reached that I did not copy agreement. you. <laughs> didn't expect Peter to be using the Latin. <laughs> <laughs> but is the, does the judge... Look at people who claim, oh, I didn't know what I was doing, uh, Judge. There are, normally, people say that when it's gone or wrong. They're, they tend to be fairly sceptical. It's quite common in um, cases where, looking, where banks are looking for summary judgment in relation to debts. And people say, oh, well, I had this conversation with my bank manager and we agreed such and such. And there's no documentary evidence. But then there are some cases where the courts are sufficiently satisfied that there is a question to be determined and they allow it to go to full hearing as opposed to giving what we call summary judgment. Um, the other thing we should say is that there's a, there are a lot, there's a lot of legislation that surrounds certain types of contract. In fact, almost every type of contract you can think of. So, for example, there's the Sale of Goods and Supply of Services Act, which governs basically any contract for the sale of goods or supply of services, which is obviously the vast majority of contracts. There's... Uh, there's um, uh, legislation concerning unfair dismissals, which Peter would yes. know more about, anything to do with employment law. There's legislation concerning landlord and tenant law, both in the um, commercial sphere, but also in the residential sphere, the separate. Um, so all of those sort of contracts are governed by legislation. So you have less, should we say, wriggle room when you're entering into any of those sort of contracts than you would have and otherwise. My pals, the barroom lawyers, always are quick to tell me that on the Sale of Goods Act, that if the, uh, the, the store incorrectly marks a product, that they have to sell it to you, even if the decimal point is two points out or something. Is that true? Do you know that? Uh, in fact, I think it's almost the, the opposite. The... Um, the, the, the general rule is that the price that is on a a product in the store is only what they call an invitation to treat. Yes. But the offer is made when you bring that product up to the till, 
that then you hand it over. And if they say, actually, we can't sell you this for whatever reason, you can't say, but I have to have it because it was out on the, on the, on the it was out at a particular price. Um, so in fact, no, that, that is not binding. The, oh, no, yeah, wow. Wow, that's that's so great. It is often. so long since I've heard an invitation to treat. That's kind of first year contract law. First year contract law. First day. First day. In, now, back the, to you, Peter Leonard, about uh, the contract for work. What constitutes a contract of, between an employer and employee? If you meet me back to the pub, you say, Jesus, you're a grand lad. Uh, you could do a bit of work for me. Is what? that a contract? Um, yes, it is a contract. Yes, it can be a contract. A chat in a pub is a contract. No, it's not a contract. But once you start performing work, ah, if, you en- if you enter yeah. into it. So, like, I mean, if I say, look, I'll see you next Tuesday morning and will you start on the site? OK, nothing has happened until the individual turns up on the site, grabs their shovel and starts, you know, making sand and cement, mixing sand and cement, whatever, to continue the metaphor. So so once that happens, then there's what you call mutuality of obligation. We're getting a bit complicated here. So you have basically both parties are participating. One is giving something to the other. For example, the employer is giving wages to the, the worker. The worker is giving their labour to the employer. So that's the mutuality of obligation. And that's a valid contract. Now, in employment law, we have things called independent contractors. That's something completely different. Maybe I'm straying into different territory there. But it's quite, whether somebody is is working subject to a contract of employment, they are an employee. Where are, where, whether somebody is working, giving their contracted, contracted services on an irregular basis, for example, and therefore they're not an employee. So they don't have a contract of employment with the employer, though they have an arrangement. People that makes written, sense. People have written books and made movies and TV series about the quirks and quirkinesses of law. Is there any such examples that you can think of uh, pertaining to contract law that you say, this is a really funny one or a really unusual one? You know that you can, as far as I know, if it's true, that you can write a check, not that anybody writes checks anymore, on the back of a cow, for example. That, and that, that, that is, that's a famous spoof case. It was, uh, but it was, is uh, true, written, isn't it? No, no, it was written by A.P. Herbert in a, in a book ah. called Misleading Cases. And it's been cited in so much case law that it's treated as if it's a... A real case. Yet again. Well, that's what you're getting, folks. I'm wrong. Listening to this the fifth court. Actually, that's what the level of expertise you're going to get. We better get on to the podcast, that podcast in a second. <laughs> so therefore, that's two things now I have uh, that have been debunked. One, I can no longer go into my local Tesco and give out to them. And two, I can't write in the back of a cow. I'm not saying you can't write in the back of a cow. <laughs> just the case that was based on that notion was, to, was, was a fictitious case. Any other quirkies? Well, what about, what about but, frustration of contract? So what happens when a contract can't be performed? <clears throat> Mark, you, you might know more about this than I do. But but the leading cases, I think, in relation to frustration of contract sort of have a contemporary res- resonance because they relate to the coronation of Edward the Sixth, Edward the Fifth, son of Queen Victoria. Who was he? Edward, Edward the, the seventh. seventh. Edward the Seventh, okay. So Edward the Seventh, anyway, was he was going to be crowned in Westminster Abbey or whatever. And then he was due to go on a boat ride up the Thames. So all these people who are fans of this, because as we know, just like the late lamented Queen Elizabeth II, Queen Victoria was there for a long time. So people who are big into this, they hadn't got an opportunity to see this for a long time. So there was a whole load of hotel rooms along the embankment in London and people had paid a lot of money. There was a top premium, even back in those days. It was like Garth Brooks. Uh, They'd paid extra money to have a hotel room with a view of the Thames so you could see Edward VII in all his glory with his new crown on his head. But it rained on that day and as a result, the the coronation procession along the Thames was cancelled. Uh, and therefore the contract could not be performed. So all these people who had shelled out a lot of money said, no, there's no valid contract here. It is frustrated. And it went to, you know, to the courts in, in England and ultimately where the con- contract could not be performed, it was deemed to be invalid and they were able to walk away from the contract. That's my understanding of it, Mark. Am I right? I don't remember the particular case, but certainly that... You yeah, were there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I never was. <laughs> um, the, the, yeah, the... the um, I mean, frustration is always going to be an issue in relation to contract, that if it can't be performed. But going back to your example of somebody who you meet in the pub and when does it become a contract? I mean, well, you, you need to look at all the circumstances, like, for example, if time is the essence. So say you're the producer of a play and your leading man or your leading lady suddenly falls ill. and You kind of go, we can't go ahead. And you meet another actor or actress or actor in the pub 
and you say, would you be able to take the part? And they say, definitely, I'll be there on Monday. And you say, great, the show goes on. You arrive on Monday and the person you met in the pub doesn't turn up. Well, then you definitely had a contract the, 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 the time you met them because you wouldn't be going on. You've relied on the fact that, you said, that they said that they'd be there. And then you have an action for damages against that person. But then you go up to the judge and you say, judge, he told me this, that and the other. Yeah. And the judge said, prove it, I presume. Mm. How, how, can, how can you prove it? Well, it's a, that, that, that's a matter of evidence. I mean, all, almost all court cases that re rely on one person's word against another are literally a qu question of the judge or the jury sitting there listening to what people say and saying who is more credible. And they tend to look at, Adrian Hardiman used to have this great phrase, islands of fact. They look at what would make one person's account more credible than the other. And so, sometimes there are certain facts that just tend to show that one person's account is more credible than the other. Hire one. the right lawyer. That's it, Colonel. You know, <laughs> advocacy, advocacy. That's that's the crucial factor. And it probably is, actually. Now, which is a neat segue, since you've now done your work, you're allowed to give the next five or so minutes of a plug for your new podcast called The Fifth Court. Who, what's going to be on? When will people hear it? Where will they listen to it? OK, well, will I, will I start on this, Mark? So, like, thank you for your very kind introduction where you, you made, the, made, made people aware of the fact that we previously had a podcast called Law on Trial, which we did with this Sunday Business, our friends in the Sunday Business Post. Award-winning. Award-winning, that was it. So we've kind of moved away from that and we're starting over and we've come up with this concept of the fifth court. So it's going to be myself and Mark and a couple of things. We're going to have interesting interviews all the time with major players in the law. And that's going to take on board the law library, the courts, all the solicitors out there, the massive new corporate firms that are entering the market. And we're going to talk about that as well as traditional issues like, for example, traditional rural solicitors practices and issues that arise. We're also going to have, and this is something that Mark is, as the editor of, of Decisis, is very much across. We're going to refer to crucial cases. So cases that have been published in the intervening period between programmes, which hopefully are going to be every week. Uh, we're going to refer to those and we're going to discuss those and pick out an interesting case, three or four of them each week, and we're going to talk about those. And we're also um, going to discuss certain topics that arise in the law. So it's going to be conversation style. Um, that's the hope, but it, it will be informative at all times. That's the duty. Uh, and, you know, hopefully there'll be a little bit of entertainment value in, in the sense that we will engage with some interesting stuff. But it is very much, hopefully it is going to be informative. That is the intention. We Mark. definitely hope to meet the Rethian ideal of both being both entertaining and informative and educational. That was the, the three pillars of Lord Reith. One of the things that I learned from you, Peter, I think, is that the, uh, the, the market that you're aiming at, there are, we, I know we're a litigious bunch. I never knew, and am I right in saying, that there are 25,000 solicitors yes. in this country? Yes, there are. And growing by the, by the hour. 25,000 yes. for an island of... Now, it's gone crazy with corporate firms because of post-Brexit. I mean, international firms are establishing here on a daily basis. Just go down the Keys. I had to go down the Keys the other night to um, the Three Arena and it's just solicitors' firms either side. So it's growing all the time. Uh, and it is, we are a litigious nation, but so is every nation. You know, things go wrong and they need people need representation. So it is. So there is a big constituency of solicitors out there. And us in the Law Library, there's probably about 1,500 of us who are practising at the moment, Mark. I think technically, there's over 2,000. I think a lot of, uh, sort of, yeah, I think it's about 2,000 are, are on the Law Library uh, website. Yes, you know, so, and I mean, again, this is something that hopefully will appeal to the universities. Every third level college now has a law faculty. Once upon a time, it used to be just kind of confined to UCD, Trinity, Galway, Cork, wherever. But now there's law faculties everywhere. And, you know, a, a law has become a component part of a lot of degrees. People doing economics and law, history and law, classics and law, whatever in law, acting in law, maybe, you know. So, so the point is, it, it's relevant. And we hope to reach out to people like that as well and just make it, the, the trick is, the trick is with this and, Dare I say it, when we won the award, and it was wonderful to win the award, but we it, we got the award because we brought important legal topics to our audience and also we brought important interviewees to our audience and we explain things. And that's that's the hope that we can explain things maybe in language that's a little bit more simple than the documents sometimes that you get as you're going into court.
part. And you debunk, as you have just done, because I'm no longer, as I mentioned, going to my Tesco looking for my cheap uh, goods. And as I mentioned, the, the cow was no longer going to be in my back pocket to pay my bills. The decisis that uh, you mentioned, uh, Mark, yeah. what is exactly is decisis? So decisis is an online uh, <clears throat> law reporting service. Uh, we've been running it for, for nearly uh, 13 years now, started in January 2011. We basically we prepare a short and readable report on every new judgment that's delivered, which at this stage is about 1,400 new judgments every year. So we have about 14,000 reports of judgments of the Irish Superior Courts that we've published. And obviously there's more coming up every week. Doesn't that's it sound like that. a wonderland, doesn't it? Well, <laughs> if you're interested in that kind of thing, it must be nerd it's great. central. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Train spotting for first, lawyers. First podcast goes out when and with whom? Mark? We are recording our first podcast early next week with Mr. Justice Gerard Hogan, who's going to talk to us all about the Free State Constitution because it was enacted by Dáil Éireann in October of 1922 and we're just coming up to the centenary of it. And it is the foundation document, legal document of our country. That's yeah. really interesting. No, we're, we're delighted with that because it, it is, we, you don't normally get access to Supreme Court justices. It's kind of cool that he, we're starting with him. It's kind of cool. Okay, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Leonard, Mark Tottenham, thank you both for joining us on That Great Business Show and the very, very best with The Fifth Court, your brand new podcast. It'll be a while. And the, sorry, Mark, what are you heartbeat. saying? Our higher in a heartbeat. I forgot. How could you, you forget your higher in a heartbeat? Oh my good Lord, I forgot about that. Mark Tottenham, who would you higher in a heartbeat? <laughs> Funny you should ask. <laughs> well, do you know what? The numbers of people who I ask, well, who would you higher in a heartbeat? And they haven't even read the blooming email. At least the Well, I'm a long-term <laughs> listener to your show. First time appear, appearer. Um, so, who would you hire in a heartbeat, Mark well, Tottenham? With, with, with my decisive hat on, uh, my two the, my two dream consultants or mentors would be either Mike Bloomberg or Lionel Barber, uh, formerly of the FT, uh, because both of them have managed to transfer the, um, the, the the into the online media world and have managed to not compromise on quality when doing so. Okay, well, Mike Bloomberg will give you a buzz. And um, is Lionel Barber still with us? Uh, he, he's still very much with us, but he's not with the FT anymore. Yeah, he, he left the FT, I think, about a year and a half ago. Good. Mr. Leonard, well, did you read your email? Well, I, do you know what I did? I did. I mean, I've, I've had a litany of people from uh, You've already David been Boys, here. Yeah. Damien Duff. Yeah. Um, so you're allowed to... Richard you know, Shakespeare. Do you remember Richard Shakespeare from Dublin City Council? Uh, oh, yeah, if you remember what I said about Richard Shakespeare, do you remember what well, I said? Well, you just thought all those plays and sonnets that he wrote were wonderful. <laughs> but uh, we, 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 we identified it was a different individual, but a top man. All, uh, ironically, and this we had no prearranging here, I've actually gone for a journalist as well. Go ahead. So the person I'd hire in a heartbeat, and it, he is somebody who's available for employment because he's just retired, is a man called John Witherow who's just retired as editor's editor of the Times newspaper, uh, previously an editor of the Sunday Times, and he's been a legendary journalist, war correspondent for many years. Um, and what I love about this man is that he took over the Times. Now, we know it's a, a Rupert Murdoch publication, so we won't say too much about that. But it is, you know, it is a paper of record in, in the UK, and it does produce quality journalism. But the wonderful thing about him is that last year, the Times newspaper made 32 million pounds in profit. Now, for someone like myself who worked in, in newspapers all those years ago, and I lament the thought that newspapers are going to die, wither on the vine, be no more. When you go into your shop, you won't see that ray, array of titles. It is wonderful to see that somebody is leaving a newspaper in profit and that the future of the Times is very much secure. So I would hire him in a heartbeat. And you can also hire the Minister for Finance for taking VAT of the price of a newspaper right. as well in the budget. That was Peter Leonard and Mark Tottenham who have reminded me how to run my own podcast. Thank you so much for, to both of you because that is it from That Great Business Show, episode 107. I won't mention it again. Just press the share button on LinkedIn or if you're listening on Spotify, send your favourite business podcast to your mates via WhatsApp. They will love you for it. And the big question for your business, why are you not advertising with us? 
big red cloud does, as have Microfinance Ireland, Virgin Media and Uderos the Goethe. Our audience is truly engaged and our ads deliver incredible value for money. We record at the Dublin South Podcast Studios, where we're joined by a new sound engineer today. That is Lee Brennan. Thank you, Lee. Later on, Neil Horner will add in a few extra sparkles to make us the best sounding podcast on earth. If you'd like to record a podcast, contact the Dublin South Podcast Studios. It's where we will be recording the Fifth Court from now on. And if you would like the media group to produce a podcast for you or your business or on one of your favourite topics, then do talk to me, Connell O'Horan. Find me on LinkedIn. We are planning another handful of podcasts. All of our great business insights and tips are brought to you, as always, thanks to our sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil, the world's best all-natural shaving oil. They back us. Please back them. DeFactoShave.com will get them. And do not forget to buy Business Plus magazine, where we now have our regular column all about the podcast. So from me, Conal Amora, and Mila Bajas for listening. Agus Salam Tamo.